Good morning. Church. Glad you could join us here this morning. Um, we're going to have a uh, time of uh, worship and praise and uh, teaching, time of teaching, and then uh, we'll share communion together. And for those of you that are watching at home on live stream, please uh, take an opportunity right now to grab together to the elements of communion so you have those close to hand when we, when we share communion later on in the service. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this glorious day that you've given us for the opportunity we have to, to gather together in your name. Pray, Father, for your spirit to fill us here this morning, to, to draw us closer to you, to open our ears, to hear your word spoken, and see how you want us to apply it in our lives. We pray this, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Sing a new song to him who 
sit on heaven's mercy seat. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain, holy, holy is He. Sing a new song to Him who sits on heaven's mercy seat. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. marks 19 months that we've had an online uh, live stream. I never believed that this would have gone on for 19 months. Um, I, I learned one thing during this pandemic. I do not have the gift of prophecy <laughs> because I thought this thing would have been done a long time ago. But you know, we've, I think, mentioned this before. We are going to continue this live stream uh, on into the future, even when things are at a place where we're comfortable and coming back and people are here in our auditorium and able to worship together with us. We have found that um, there are people that oftentimes, not just with COVID, but maybe they're homesick or convalescing and they're able to watch our live stream. Um, several of us have family members out of state that are watching our, our, on our Sunday worship services. We even have people in the Middle East and in Europe that are watching our live streams. Just a, an incredible blessing to know that what we do here in this little church in Los Gatos is ministering to people literally around the world, and, and we're grateful for that. And so we are going to continue that, but again, we are anxious, as Ray said, for the day when we can all come back together and, and be in this, this room together. 
Today we are continuing on in our study of the book of Galatians. We are in Galatians chapter 5, and I have some big news for you. For the last seven weeks, we've been in uh, Galatians 5 verse 22. Today we're making it all the way to verse 23, so we're making some progress here. We are looking at the fruit of the Spirit. There are nine different qualities that God has instructed us that through the power of His Holy Spirit that we are to display to this world, and they are fruit... And God is very intentional in that, that name, that term, because they are things that have to be nurtured, things that have to be developed in us. When you first come to Christ, they, they may not be things that are just instantaneously, automatically there. And so they truly are a sign of maturity, of growth, of a deepening of your faith and your walk with Christ. And so these nine fruit of the Spirit are so important. And today we're looking at the fruit of gentleness. And again, that's in Galatians chapter 5, verse 23. And I came across another truth this week that really impacted me. And I pray and I trust that it will you as well. Each of these fruit are characteristics, not just of what God wants us to display, but they are things that he displays as well. And so as he manifests them in his character, in his life, in his being, he models them for us, and then we have kind of a pattern of how we are to display them. And I believe that, but I thought it was also very interesting that when we come to this character trait of gentleness, and I don't know that I ever realized this before, I don't know that I realized this truth, but in the Old Testament, God is never referred to as gentle, or that he has the quality of gentleness. It's not until the New Testament when we meet the person of Christ come in his first coming, his first advent upon the earth, where the term gentleness is applied to God. And I thought that was so interesting. And I had to kind of wrestle with that for a minute. And I had to try to figure out in my own thinking, why is that? And I believe, and I've shared with you before, that the God of the Old Testament is the same as the God of to nurture, to train up, to to disciple, if you will, his people. And I thought, well, that makes perfect sense. Let me, if I can, for a moment, just use my life as an example. Not that I am as near to being like God as I want to be, but at least it kind of resonates in my thinking. Georgia and I have four children. We have one girl and three boys. All of our children today are, are married. They're, you know, but adults, they're conducting their own lives. But when our kids were young, when they were at home, I had a very different relationship than I do with them today. Let me pick on my daughter for a second. When my daughter was maybe in high school, she may have come home and said, Dad, we're going out tonight with a group of friends and we're going to you know, be out for just driving the car and be home at a certain time. Uh, To me, that was part of parenting and and protecting my daughter and and kind of overseeing her. Today, my daughter is 42. (laughs) She has four children of her own, and she may inadvertently or casually say, you know, Dad, I'm going someplace. I no longer say, who are you going with? Who's driving the car? What time are you going to be home? You see, my relationship with her is very different. There was a time when she was being nurtured, being developed, being discipled, if you will, trusting that those things would stick with her and that in her adulthood they would be true, which I'm glad to say they are. But do you see how when our, our children, when the relationships are young, sometimes they seem a little bit more, if I can say the word, stern, more strict, more disciplined, because there's so much nurturing the cares. And and again, the relationship is very different. And I think that's why we see in the Old Testament, God is not referred to as gentle because he's having to establish what it means to be holy and righteous, to be a person who averts sin in their life and, and pursues righteousness. And come the New Testament and the coming of the Holy Spirit, and we have God at work within us, it's a completely different relationship. Now, I don't know if that helps anybody else. I don't know if that was all for Kevin. (laughs) But for me, I really wanted to make sure I knew why is it that we don't refer to God in the Old Testament as gentle and in the New Testament we do. And yet we also say he is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. 
And we've got to get our mind wrapped around those. So again, I look at myself. I love my daughter completely when she was a high school student. And now that she's a mom of her own, my love is still the same. The love doesn't change. I'm the same yesterday, today, and I trust on into the future. But there were different responsibilities, different things that needed to be accomplished within her that required a different type of parenting. I know in our room and, and online, we've got people that are parents of younger children. Maybe that helps when all of a sudden you feel like, man, I feel like I'm always saying no. <laughs> I feel like I'm the disciplinarian, right? And I'm looking forward to that day when I say, hey, let's just have fun together. And that day will come, I promise you. But it's, it's important to know that what we do in those early stages are so worth it in the long run. So we talk about a God who is gentle. And we talk about this quality of gentleness that we are to display as one of these fruit of the Spirit. So let me begin by just simply asking you, maybe you can kind of start processing this in your mind, but when you think of gentle, what is it that your mind kind of conjures up? What do you think of when you think of gentle or gentleness? Maybe it's holding something delicate. Yeah, maybe like an egg. Maybe some work of art that's fragile. Maybe it's even for some of us, it's holding a baby. You know, when even though I was a dad and Georgia presented me with a baby, I wasn't real comfortable. I've never been around kids until I had kids. And I remember I sitting in a rocking chair just frozen. And Georgia would say, well, move. I go, oh, okay, I can do that, you know. I was just so afraid of holding this, this delicate little life in my hands. I, I just didn't get it. Maybe it's not in the physical world. Maybe it's something else that you think of when you hear the word gentle. Maybe you think of something that's soothing or peaceful or maybe even relaxing. Maybe it's the way that you treat someone. You treat them kind. You treat them in a way very, that's tender. There, there's no harshness about you. And so we may have different ideas, concepts, things about gentleness, and, and maybe they're all true. But I think one of the reasons that God calls us to be people that are gentle, to display gentleness, is because when you look at our world, I think our world is lacking in gentleness. I think many people in our world even have a wrong, wrong perspective of gentleness. They see it as a, a weakness. You know, if somebody's gentle, you can take advantage of them. They're not really a strong individual, and, and so we can use or abuse them, and, and so we see them as weak or, or passive. Certainly, they're not assertive at all, but in actuality, and I'm going to help you to see this, I believe, today, real gentleness is a sign of strength. Now, that may be kind of contradictory in your own thinking. You may be thinking gentle, strength, and they don't go together. But they truly do. In a harsh and an unforgiving world like we live in, in a real vicious world, there's not much that is gentle. And so it's no wonder, when you think about it, that God is calling you and I, the household of faith, to be this instrument that, that applies gentleness to the world. Now, as I mentioned, gentleness truly is a mark of strength. Listen to the definition of gentleness. Now, you may not spend a lot of time looking up words that you think you know. I, I don't. But part of my job is to talk on about words, and I think, oh, I better make sure I know what that one means, right? And I looked up the word gentleness, and listen to this. Gentleness is defined as a humble, non-threatening demeanor, we're probably all going, yeah, I, I get it, that derives itself from a position of strength. Whoa, I didn't see that coming. That derives its position, it, from, that derives its demean, demeanor from a position of strength and authority. So that's why Jesus, in his strength, I believe, and in his authority, was able to be the coming of gentleness to the world. Why in the New Testament, all of a sudden, we see this gentleness ascribed to God. Because now we have God amongst us, God in our presence, Christ incarnate. 
And so that's why in Matthew chapter 11, verses 20 through 30, listen to Jesus. When he invites us to come, he says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle. For I am gentle. I am gentle and humble of heart, and it's there that you will find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. It's in his gentleness that his strength is displayed. Very interesting analogy that Jesus uses here. This yoke is like a, a wooden harness that two ox would be bolted together. And so there would usually be an older ox and a younger ox. And the older one knew the path, and it might be just going in a circle to grind wheat, or maybe it was to go straight and to plow fields. But the older ox knew what it was supposed to do, and the younger ox didn't. And that's why they would yoke the oxen together that the old one could train the younger. And Jesus says, take my yoke. He's the one who's going to train us. Take my yoke upon you. And then he says, for my burden is light. It's easy. I'm not strapping you down because it's grueling work. I want to show you what life can be, what a fulfilled life can be. And it has to do with a gentleness. I love that about him. You see, being gentle is a very Christ-like action. And so in our world, and when I talked about, you know, in our world, some people have a, a misunderstanding, a wrong definition, that they see it as a sign of weakness, and somebody can be abused. I saw several heads nodding and saying, yeah, because that's probably the people that you've dealt with, and they see something in you, and they think, oh, I can take advantage of that person. That's going to be a weak individual, and they don't understand that to be weak truly is a mark and a sign of strength. And I'm going to help you to see that, I think, even more so as we go through today. Because that is so critically important to our life in displaying this fruit of the Spirit of gentleness. Gentleness against one of the fruit of the Spirit, and we're called upon to display it and to bring peace in a world that is peaceless. You see, it requires, as I've already mentioned, a maturity, and it requires a strength. And so as a mature believer, we're called upon to display this gentleness to, to the world. Listen to how Peter says it. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, he says, But in your hearts set apart Christ Jesus as Lord, and be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks for you to give a reason for the hope that's within you. So when you're proclaiming Christ... When you're demonstrating through your life that there's something different, something unique, something about you that causes people to identify the fact that, you know, you're different from, from everybody else that I, I run with. You, you have qualities, you have character traits, you, there's things about you that you're not like everyone else in the world. And when people ask you, Peter says, be ready to give a defense, but then he also adds this in verse 15, he says, but do this with gentleness and respect. You see, Christ in us should cause for us to have that tenderness in concern, compassion, understanding, in love for others, knowing that they're hopelessly lost. But because of our strength, we can be assured in presenting the truth of the gospel and, and their desperate need for Jesus and who he is, what he represents to them. And so we do this not in a condescending way, you sinner, or in a way, oh, you're going to hell. But we do it with a gentleness, with a compassion, with a love. You see, one of the reasons that people, or and I think believers included in this, do not show gentleness is because we have this desire or this natural instinct maybe to protect ourselves, to preserve ourselves, Because some of us are caught up in that wrong definition that the world has. Well, if I'm weak, they're going to take advantage of me. If I'm weak, I'm going to be the one that's used, abused, and I'm never going to get my way. And it's because in this world, that's what we've been taught. 
And so true gentleness truly is other individual, other person focused. We're not looking at what's, what's in it for me. We're trying to figure out how we can serve others, assist others, minister to others. And this, again, I believe requires incredible strength. Because I'll, I'll be honest with you. There are times when I'll see somebody and they'll, it's just very clear, that person needs Jesus. Is it an easy thing or is it a thing of strength to go up to them and say, let me tell you. And for most of us, it requires strength to do that. You know, we, we don't want to, because of what our culture has taught us, crowd their space or invade their space or come across in a holier-than-thou kind of way. And, and so, what do we do? We just pull back. But it takes a strength through gentleness, through compassion, to truly share with the individual, the person that God's brought into our life, of their need for Christ. Do you see why it takes strength and why gentleness and strength are coupled together? I, again, I love that definition. Listen to what the psalmist says in Psalm 40, verse 8. I desire to do your will, my God, for your principles are treasured within my heart. And so doing his will is something that, that we want to do, that we set our hearts and our lives to do. But again, sometimes it's tough because of the things that this culture has kind of levied or imposed upon us. And doing God's will is hard. Because again, we would rather do my will. <laughs> I'd rather... In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said something very interesting. Again, we're talking about how gentleness is other-focused. It's looking for ways to assist, to minister to others. In the Sermon on the Mount, chapter, Matthew chapter 5, verse 5, Jesus said, blessed are the, and some of the translations of Scripture say gentle. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Some translations say blessed are the meek. Some say blessed are the lowly. Some say blessed are the humble, for they shall inherit the earth. Isn't it interesting that different translations have dealt with that word differently? Meek, gentle, humble, lowly. One translation even says the downcast. <laughs> for they shall inherit the earth. And we think, well, there we are. If I can just be beat up by everybody else, yeah, and in the end, it comes out okay, right? The reason that we have so many different words in different translations trying to help us to understand the concept is because, now I know some of you in this room speak other languages. And when you go from one language to another, sometimes there is just no word. There's not a, an English equivalent for the word that was used in the language that I'm translating. It happens in Spanish, it happens in, uh, is a word that there is no word for it in English. And that makes a problem. And so in the original, Jesus said, makarios praus, blessed are the praus. And the word praus means meek, lowly. Well, I can't tell you what it means because there's no English word for it. You see the problem? <laughs> So what do we do with that? Well, fortunately, we have an example in Scripture. There was a Hebrew equivalent of that word that Jesus used. And it spoke of a man named Moses and said Moses was the meekest man who ever lived. Oh, so if I look at Moses, I can get at least an example of what it is to be this meek or this gentle type of person that we're studying today. And so I look at Moses and I think, oh, well, he was a real spineless guy. Everybody used him as a doormat. He never stood up for what he wanted, what he believed. And I think, wait a minute, that's not the Moses that I studied. I, I read about a guy who saw a Hebrew being abused and he killed the Egyptian that was abusing him. I read about a Moses who was wanted for murder in ancient Egypt, and after 40 years on the run, God says, go back, 
and there's no statute of limitations for murder in ancient Egypt. So just simply by showing up, Pharaoh could have said, off with his head, take him out and kill him, and been right in doing so. It took incredible courage, incredible strength to come back. And then at that point, he stands in front of Pharaoh and he says, tell you what, Pharaoh, I'm kind of paraphrasing, this is how I think he probably said it. Tell you what, Pharaoh, <laughs> let my people go. Let all of your slaves that are Israelites, let them, just let them go. And scholars say there were between 4 and 12 million Israelite slaves that belonged to the Pharaoh that day. The reason we don't know is because in those days you only counted the men. So there were 4 to 12 million Israelites, and, Mer and Pharaoh, excuse me, Moses says, let them go. And a matter of fact, we're not going to pay you anything. We just want you to release them. But when they go, let them pocket all they can from Egypt and, and just be free. Now, is that your idea of a weak, spineless, abused type of individual? It's, I think, the strongest kind of person that, that, that could be. What does it mean to be a prouse type individual, the word originally used? What does it mean to be the meekest type of individual that it says of Moses in Exodus 30? It means somebody who gets to a point in their life when they say, you know what, it doesn't matter what happens to me. It matters what happens for the kingdom of God. And that's why this Moses said, you know what, doesn't matter if I'm executed, doesn't matter if I'm laughed at, if I'm ridiculed. This is what God has called me to do, and I'm going to be obedient. I'm going to put the kingdom first and, and self second. This is why Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount said, blessed are the people who are meek, humble, lowly, whatever word, prouse you want to use. These are the people who put the kingdom first and self second. That goes against, that is contrary to our culture. Our culture says it's all about me. And Christ is saying it's all about him. And so what we do when we see someone that desperately needs to hear, we say, you know what? It's all about Jesus. It doesn't matter if they laugh at me. It doesn't matter if they ridicule me. It doesn't matter if they say, oh, you're some Jesus freak. It doesn't matter if they say, you know what? I'm going to have to sever the relationship because your eternity is far more important than this relationship. Do you see now why gentleness requires incredible strength? And that's what, what Christ is trying to help us to see. That is what Moses modeled for us. And this is what we're being called to be. People who put the kingdom of God even ahead of self. And that goes against everything that our human instinct tells us. This self-preservation. And you guys, that's hard. I am not saying for a second that it's easy. But it is a fruit of the Spirit. That if you develop, if you nurture, if you allow it to grow to full fruition in your life, You'll become more so the person that Christ is calling you to be as you conform more so to his very image. James chapter 4, the brother of Jesus said, my food is to do the will of the Father. The thing that gives me life, the thing that gives me sustenance, the thing that keeps me going is to do his will and not mine. Secondly, a gentle person is also a teachable person. <laughs> Being teachable requires a humility. It, it requires a humbleness. It requires a gentleness. An arrogant person <laughs> is hard to teach. Have you ever tried to teach somebody and they already say, I know it all. <laughs> I've already got this one figured out. And now you're trying to teach them? What, what happens? They just shut you out. They don't listen. I have been a parent of four. <laughs> I have taught for 30 plus years at, at really every level. I've taught from kindergarten through graduate school. And in any one of those settings, I've had students that feel like, you can't teach me nothing. <laughs> I know it all already. And it's true. You can't teach them. <laughs> 
because there is a, a wall that they put up, there's a barrier that they hide behind, and they won't allow you to penetrate their heart or their mind. So being teachable requires a gentleness. In Psalm 119, verse 33, the psalmist says, Teach me, O Lord, your way of truth, that I might follow you all of my days. You see, we need to have that kind of response, that kind of heart that the psalmist had, and the kind of heart that Jesus had as well. One of the, I think, greatest passages in the New Testament is Philippians chapter 2. In Philippians 2, Paul is helping us to wrap our head around really a very incredibly difficult concept of theology, where he is saying Christ is 100% man. And he's saying he is 100% God. Now, I'm not a good mathematician. Ask anybody, but I know that you can't have something more than 100%. I know a lot of times people say, I love you 110%. Or I'm gonna... There's really nothing more than 100%. And Paul is saying, how can somebody be 100% man and 100% God? And theologians use a big wow word, and they call that the hypostatic union. Forget that. You don't need to know it. But they're saying that he is completely God and completely man. Because you see, if he wasn't man, then he couldn't be sacrificed. And if he wasn't God, his sacrifice wouldn't count. It's a beautiful passage. But in Philippians 2, Paul tells the Philippians, and he tells you and me, he says, have this same attitude in you, which was in Christ Jesus himself. Although he existed in the form as God, he did not consider being God something to be held onto or grasped. But he willingly emptied himself to the point of death on Calvary's cross. It's a beautiful passage. And Jesus models for us this teachability. He concocted this plan himself with the Father and the Spirit millennia previous in the heavens and said, there's got to be some way to redeem these people. And I'll go. I'll be the sacrifice. And he submits himself to the teaching, to the plan, to the will of God. That is an incredible kind of love that he has for us. That's why in Proverbs verse four, chapter 4, verse 5, it says that we get wisdom and we gain understanding by learning from his word and being one who will not turn from them. A gentle person also is considerate of others. Again, remember we talked about it's really other-focused. And just as in our gentle strength, we learned that, that God put me first, Jesus did that when he willingly came to Calvary, we also need to put one another first. I've mentioned this several times, and I'm going to, wasn't it's not in my notes, but I'm going to tell you anyway. Out in our lobby, uh, in our information center, there's a, a full sheet of paper with the 59 one another passages in the New Testament. God takes pretty seriously this, how we treat one another. And some of them, for example, are Romans chapter 12, verse 10, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. You see, if we are other-focused, I am devoted to you. I am committed to you. I, I focus on you. Our consideration is also to be towards others and for their best. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 25, that verse reminds us that we are to have equal concern one for another. I don't put my needs ahead of yours. I don't put George's needs ahead of anybody else. There's to be an equal concern that we have within the household of faith. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, it says that in humility, we consider one another before ourselves. And that's hard to do. <laughs> and that's why there's a strength required as part of being gentle. I know I've quoted from Romans 12.10 already, but there's a second part to that verse. And in Romans 12.10, the second part, it says, honor one another above yourself. Above yourself. Being gentle, displaying gentleness, it really is a sign of strength. 
because it goes against everything our culture teaches us, everything that's been ingrained into us about promoting self, protecting self, preserving self, living for self. And so we need to be people who take very seriously the truth of God's word that I am going to look for ways to serve others. For you see, the greatest in the kingdom of God is not the one who wins with the most toys, right? The greatest will be the servant of all. Because that servant is somebody who is focused on others, serving others, caring for others, loving others, just as Jesus. And I want us to think about Jesus just learned about that, that that's something we're supposed to do. But again, it's not anything that he was not willing to do himself. In Matthew 26, the cross is before him. And he knows the agony of the cross. And Jesus prays, Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. I don't want to go to the cross. Remember, he's 100% human. And he knows the agony that awaits him. But he says, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. He was submissive to the will of God, just like he's asking each of us to do today. Jesus was teachable. I love this about him. He, I believe, in his mind, in his wisdom, I I, I think he knew more than we could ever conceive. But as a 12-year-old child, Jesus is sitting on the southern steps of the temple in Jerusalem, and he's listening to the rabbis, to the wise men of the day. And in Scripture, in Matthew, excuse me, in Luke chapter 2, it says, when Mary and Joseph found their son Jesus, they found Jesus at the temple, sitting in the midst of the wise men, asking questions. I think as a, a loving guy, he was saying, help, you know, others, help me to figure out how you're going to display this, implement this, live this. And that's a very teachable thing to do. And Jesus models for us again his teachability. And he was also one who would put others first. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, it says, look to Jesus. He is the author and the perfecter of our faith who for the joy of the cross, even despising its shame, will one day then sit down at the right hand of the Father. The joy of the cross? Boy, he looked at things different than I do. I look at it as as agony, pain, humiliation. But Jesus saw it as joy because It was only through that act that he would have eternity with you. That you are the focus of his heart, that you are the cause for his joy. And so he is not asking us to do anything that he himself is not willing to do. He models these for us. He lives these out for us. And when he calls us to be these gentle individuals as inspired, empowered by God, the Holy Spirit, he says, yeah, just like I've done for you. And so I want you to remember this Jesus when we come to this time of communion now. He was willing to submit himself to the will of God. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. He was teachable. He sat there at the steps asking the wise men of the day questions. And he was also one who put others first. For the joy of the cross, he endured the pain that one day we might be able to dwell with him. And so we have a God who is very gentle, and his gentleness displays a strength that he's calling you to as well. And so this morning we take this small piece of bread that reminds us of that broken body, broken for you for the payment of sin. So God bless you as you partake now of this bread that reminds us of the broken body of Jesus. And then Jesus took took the cup. And scripture says, after taking it, he blessed it and then gave it to his disciples and said, take and drink from it, all of you. This is the blood of my covenant poured out for you. So God bless you as you partake now of the cup that reminds us of the shed blood of Jesus.
Lord Jesus, we love you. We thank you for who you are. Thank you for being the gentle king who has come into our hearts and our lives today. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen.
Father, we thank you so much that you sent your Son to pay the price for our sins. Help us, Father, to, to follow the example of your Son, to let our gentleness be known as we put the, the needs and concerns of others before our own. Help us, Father, to, to see the struggles that others are going through and not be caught up in our own stuff, to open our eyes to what your Spirit would show us about the people around us and help us to show your love to them in a way that's real and personal. We pray, Father, for your strength and your courage to do so, to put ourselves out there, to be vulnerable, so that we could share your love with others. And we pray this, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> I think one of the things that I appreciate the most about the relationship I have with God through His Son is that that I can I can look at the stuff around me and, and see His hand in it and take joy in it, knowing that it's not all about me. Uh, it takes some pressure off when you don't think that everything is about you. You know, when we're all caught up in our own stuff. We take ourselves way too far, way too seriously, and we don't see what's going on with other people. So, I like this song, and I hope you do too. And uh, I hope it uh, brings some joy into your into your heart this morning. Oh, 
God. Oh, I love to be with you, beautiful God. Oh, I love to be with you, beautiful God. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us this morning, whether you're here or at home. Uh, we're glad you, you spent the time with us, and I pray that, uh, that Kevin's words uh, touched your heart and helped you see more clearly um, God's plan for your life. A uh, few announcements. Uh, we have our Monday night men's and women's Bible studies. Uh, those are Zoom studies, so the uh, Zoom address is available on our website at hopesearch.org. And uh, Kevin continues his uh, Thursday night? Tuesday, Tuesday night, Tuesday night uh, series on the attributes of God. Uh, that's also a Zoom class, and it is uh, the address also is available on the website. I just pray that uh, each of us will will open our hearts to what God would have us do, and how He would have us respond to others around us. I know that far too often I'm I'm not open to it, and and. I regret that in many ways. But I know that I have the opportunity each day to do differently, to turn my focus away from myself and to focus on the people around me and to let God's Spirit fill me and, and strengthen and encourage me to do His will. And I pray that we will each take that opportunity this week to, to not think so much about ourselves and think about others because, you know, it's relationships that make a difference in our lives. If we cut ourselves off from other people, we just get too full of our own head, you know? And I think we need to reach out, especially during this time when we're all so separated and, and socially distanced. And I mean, for me, it's difficult. I, can't, I, I don't hear well, so I have to read people's lips and I can't see what anybody's saying these days because they all got masks on. So you really gotta, you really gotta put an effort in. I know, and you really have to put an effort in to, to hear what people want to say, and to listen, not just hear it, but listen. And you know, we don't need to speak necessarily, but we need to, we need to be available to people. So I pray that we'll go out there and we'll do that this week, and it won't be just this week. It'll be something that we do on an ongoing basis as we as we open our hearts to God's spirit and how, and how he wants us to be an influence in the people's lives around us. So go out there, have a great week. Pay attention for the opportunities that God puts in front of you. And remember that Jesus loves you so much. Amen. Amen.